let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, for some of you, good afternoon and, and good evening. Uh, welcome to the 15th annual Muslim Studies Program Conference. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you all with us. My name is Muhammad Khalil. I'm the director of the Muslim Studies Program at Michigan State University. Uh, we're delighted to have you all with us. As you can see, uh, this is a we're using a webinar format. So what that means is that the presenters will be able to you know, turn on their video and so on. Uh, everyone else will be able to participate through the Q&A. Uh, and we do this for various reasons. We can get into that later, or if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. But anyway, uh, we have an exciting conference for you. Uh, the, the title of the conference is Belonging Nowhere, States of Statelessness and Displacement in the Muslim World. And we have presenters from various parts of the country and indeed the world. Uh, and it's a pleasure to have them all with us. We, the, what we happened is in the summer, we issued a call for papers and we selected the best proposals. And of course, we also have a keynote uh, by Professor Rochelle Davis of Georgetown. So we have uh, really an exciting program for you. Um, I'd like to begin uh, with a word of welcome. Uh, and I'd like to actually invite the Dean of International Studies and Programs at Michigan State University, also an Associate Provost, uh, Dean Stephen Hansen, to say a few words of welcome. Uh, thank you, Mohammed, and welcome everybody. It's good to see you here. Uh, at, at Michigan State University, we have a, a long history of uh, comprehensive international engagement. Our approach is really to bring together disciplinary and thematic knowledge, regional expertise, and, and global partnerships in an effort to create global citizens and innovate local solutions to global problems. This conference on displacement in the Muslim world is a great example of the type of initiative that aligns with and supports our priorities. The complexity of this challenge truly requires a global lens and I'm pleased to see from the, the agenda here that uh, there are 24 presenters from various parts of the country and various parts of the world. And, as you all know, uh, Muslims comprise a significant portion of the world's refugee and stateless persons populations. So your work at this conference to understand the drivers of conflict that lead to displacement in the Muslim world, the effects it has on Muslim communities, and possible avenues for advocacy for these communities will help address the desperate challenges facing tens if not hundreds of millions around the world. And unfortunately, as a number of conflicts and ecological disasters around the world continue to proliferate and suffering, is, the importance of this conference is magnified. So I thank you for being here and bringing your energy and intellect to this important work. Have a great conference. Thank you so much, Dean Hansen. Um, and uh, at this time, I'd actually like to tell you about the three individuals who proposed this conference theme. Uh, they are Dr. Farha Abbasi, and maybe if you don't mind, maybe waving uh, so folks can see you. <laughs> Dr. Farha Abbasi of the Department of Psychiatry, also someone who is a leading figure in the area of Muslim mental health. Um, we also have Professor Najib Hurani of the Department of Anthropology. Uh, again, another, actually all three are, are really important uh, scholars uh, and leading figures, and it's really a pleasure to have them all in the Muslim Studies program. Um, and the third uh, is Professor Linda Sayed, uh, from MSU's prestigious residential college, James Madison College. Um, and actually at this time, I'd like to invite Professor Linda Sayed to say a few words about the theme. Why did they propose this theme? Thank you, Muhammad. Um, I wanna first welcome Dean Hansen, all our participants, organizers, attendees here today, and thank you for joining us. Um, I really first want to start by thanking my co-organizers, Dr. Farha Abbasi and Dr. Najib Harani, who were the brains behind the conceptual framing of this conference and envisioned a conference that spoke to the importance kind of, of displacement, statelessness, and refugee rights. Um, I also truly want to thank Muslim Studies Director Dr. Muhammad Khalil and Administrative Secretary Mary Ferdosi, who worked tirelessly to handle all the logistics from emailing participants, scheduling, technological support, publicity. So without you two, we would not be here today. So on behalf of my co-organizers, we are grateful for your leadership and support. Um, on behalf of my co-organizers, I want to say a few words about this year's um, Muslim Studies Conference, the theme, uh, the theme, Belonging Nowhere, States of Statelessness and Displacement in the Muslim World. 
emerge out of a panel I participated in with Dr. Abessi at last year's Muslim Mental Health Conference, where we discussed research examining the obstacles faced by refugees, in this case, Syrian refugees residing in neighbor countries when it came to matters of mobility, documentation, accessibility to health and social services. We also discussed kind of the implications of these struggles and the repercussions it had on future generations who were deemed unrecognizable by many countries and belonging nowhere and hence deemed stateless. So out of these conversations, we saw a need to create a space to bring like-minded scholars and activists, not only researching this topic, but willing to collectivize efforts to bring awareness and possible change. According to UNHCR, there are at least 82.4 million people around the world who have been forcibly displaced from their homes, 86% of who are currently living in the global south, with more than 68% originating from just five countries. Among them are over 26 million refugees, the highest population on record, with millions others who are stateless. These statistics do not include the nearly 6 million Palestinian refugee refugees. These numbers are not only staggering, but point to the importance of this issue. So there are many objectives, as you can see from the papers that we have today uh, for this conference, but I really wanna emphasize three main themes. First, the forced displacement of communities is by no means a new occurrence as some communities have lived in a continued state of displacement for decades, um, as in the Palestinian case. What we are witnessing is an increase of refugees and stateless persons worldwide, but particularly among Muslim majority countries and communities. Heightened conflicts, ecological disasters due to climate change have proliferated the displacement and suffering of many Muslim communities, as we see in the case of Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan, just to name a few. Speaking to this, our conference and presenters aim to not only unravel the drivers of displacement in Muslim dominated communities, but also to really bring awareness of their experience, their trauma, how they are produced, how displaced and stateless persons live and exist in these spaces and create new meaning in order to really better understand the effects of displacement. Second, when we speak to the experience of refugees and statelessness, we generally assume that such individuals and communities live in a precarious state of belonging nowhere as they try to navigate the, their place in host countries. However, what our conference really seeks to do is to shed light on how indeed it's the very powers of states, nation states, that continuously create, create states of statelessness. What we seek to do here is to investigate the very structures, power dynamics, policies, laws, and even physical walls that continue to produce and reproduce the states of statelessness and displacement. How can we also become more aware of how the very field of displacement and refugee studies is shaped by, the, by these very power structures? So even as scholars ourselves. Third and finally, we see this as a space to generate a conversation and potential advocacy while being conscientious of the fact that we as researchers are in a position of privilege. Policies and governments both nationally and internationally have always sought short-term answers. So how do we encourage inclusion of displaced communities and individuals in the structures of power to develop more long-term solutions that speak to the needs and, and to their needs and not only the needs of the powerful shareholders. So here are just kind of, as I mentioned, um, our panels and presentations today tackle these issues, but um, th these are just a few of the issues that we'll be tackling today. As the scholars here today, uh, they'll bring their insight and expertise um, to this pressing topic of belonging nowhere, the states of statelessness and displacement in the Muslim world. So I thank you all for joining us and I look forward to an enriching conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Linda Sayed. And really it's been a pleasure working with these uh, three conference organizers, uh, Professor Linda Sayed, Dr. Farha Bessi, and Professor Najib Khurani. And I, I do wanna give a special thank you uh, to Mary Ferdowsi, the administrative lead. As Professor Linda Sayed mentioned, uh, Mary has been extremely active and, and uh, you know, uh, we couldn't do this without her uh, and we really appreciate her. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank the many co-sponsors. You know, this is such an important topic, and it's probably not a surprise that there were many units in, on our campus that were interested in this. So I want to thank our various co-sponsors. They include um, the uh, African Studies Center, the Asian Studies Center, Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, College of Arts and Letters, Department of Anthropology, Department of Religious Studies, Department of Sociology, Global Studies in the Arts and Humanities, 
the Global Urban Studies Program, James Madison College, and Peace and Justice Studies. So um, with that, we now will, uh, actually I wanna tell you a little bit about the schedule. Uh, we have, so the whole conference, we have six panels and a keynote. Uh, today, the schedule runs from about 9 a.m. Eastern time to about 4 p.m. Eastern time. And tomorrow it's 9 to 3.45. And our first panel is at 9.15, so in about four minutes, three, or three, almost three and a half minutes. So uh, I'm going to actually stop now so we can set up for that first panel, which will be moderated by Professor Najib Horani. So thank you all again, and uh, we will uh, come back in about three minutes. Thank you. moderator and discuss it. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome you to my kitchen uh, from where I'm going to be moderating this discussion. Um, this is sort of a, a, a very strange thing, I think, for, for, for everybody, um, well, Still, right? I don't think this is gonna quite get normal, get to be normal. Um, in any case, my name is Najib Harani. I uh, teach in the Department of Anthropology and in the Global Urban Studies Program at the College of Social Science. Um, I'm actually, I, I call myself an honorary anthropologist uh, because I was actually trained in political science at New York University. And uh, I was able to, to find a, a wonderful job with wonderful colleagues here at, at um, Michigan State. Um, what we're going to do this morning uh, is, is have three papers. Uh, the fourth paper, uh, Mr. Benjamin Beams was not able to join us for um, health reasons. Um, so we're going to just get right into uh, the first paper, uh, Dr. Mehnaz uh, Hashimi. And she has sent us a video of her paper. So what I'm going to do is uh, bring that up and then share, share the screen. Um, Ms. Hashmi is a, a graduate from Shahid Beheshti University in Iran. She has a master's degree in international human rights law. Um, and she's focused her research on humanitarian law, refugee law, and strategies for peacemaking. Um, her thesis was focused on ways to incorporate accountability and responsibility for non-state armed groups into classic paradigms of international law. Uh, she has recently joined the Norwegian Council um, it's the Norwegian Council on Foreign Relations, I'm not sure of the, the title, um, in Iran providing legal assistance to Afghan refugees in that country. So um, without further ado, I'm going to try and call that up and share screen. And uh, no, I have to share screen first, is that right? Yes, and also I think that we have to make sure to click on those two little options at the bottom for maximizing the audio and the video. Okay. Uh-oh. I have to install the Zoom audio device. Ah, okay. So that's okay. We can come back to this one while we figure that out. Maybe meanwhile, Mary, if you're able to download it, uh, that'd be great because I'm not able to from this computer. Okay. Um, 
Oh, there we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So let's see. I can go full screen. Before I begin my present, I'd like to thank Professor Khalid and all the executive team for making it possible for us to participate in this conference. I hope I could use this opportunity to reflect on some issue that refugees in the Muslim world are struggling with. My paper is titled Iran's Legal Regime Concerning Refugee, Its Shortcomings and Upcoming Challenges. However, I have mainly focused on Afghan refugees. For one, they comprise nearly 98% of Iran's documented refugees. Also, they make up one of the largest refugee populations in the world. Nearly 6 million Afghans have been internally displaced or forced to leave their country because of escalated insecurities and armed conflict. In this presentation, I will try to explain the refugee registration system in Iran and review its history and current practice and also its shortcomings. I'm going to introduce the legal instruments that form the pillars on which Iran's legal regime has been built. And I will talk about specific regulations that have affected major aspects of refugees' lives in Iran. I will try to briefly review Iran's international obligation regarding these issues as well. And finally, I will talk a little about the situation in Afghanistan under the rule of Taliban and try to establish that a lot of people that have left the country since then may be entitled to be considered as refugees and the case should not be dismissed blindly. Starting with Iran's registration system, divided Iran's practice towards refugee registration into three categories. As you all know, the first major influx of Afghan refugees came to Iran in the 1980s after the Soviet Union invasion. At this time, Iran treated these asylum seekers with hospitality and hated by Islamic revolutionary ideas just after the Islamic revolution were welcomed as Muslim brothers and sisters. They were granted a blue card stating their situation as Mahajiri, which enabled them to have access to education, receive a work permit, and have freedom of movement. It shall be noted here, Iran did not practice any refugee status determination procedure for any of these refugees and they were considered prima facie refugees. In 1997, Iran's welcoming policy toward refugees changed to a policy of facilitation of repatriation, and the country started to deport some undocumented refugees. In 2007, Iran effectively stopped issuing any documentation for newly arrived refugees and refused to take into consideration any large asylum claim. In 2003, Iran introduced the Amoyesh registration system, which is still ongoing in the country. This registration system, again, is not a refugee, refugee status determination procedure which includes individual interviews to establish a well-founded fear of persecution according to Article 1 of the 1951 Convention of, on Refugees. This is a, actually an annual re registration system through which those who already had received documents can apply for renewing their documents again. This process is rather costly 
which is difficult for many Afghan families to pay the necessary fees. And some, especially those who are illiterate, may have trouble following up with the complex procedure. I want to also briefly address the comprehensive registration plan, which was launched in 2010 with the aim of helping many Afghan regularizing their residence in the country. In order to do so, Afghans were obliged to register and receive a travel permit, travel back to Afghanistan, receive an identity card and a passport. And then they were promised to receive a visa from Iran embassy in Afghanistan and travel back legally to Iran. However, we do not know how many visas have been issued under this scheme and we do not exactly know how many of these visas have been renewed. Moving on to Iran's legal regime, I would like to enumerate the three major legal instruments that are the basis for Iran's further rules and regulations. The 1931 law on entrance and residence of aliens in Iran, the 1963 Rules of Procedure for Refugees established by the Council of Ministers, and Article 180 of the 2000 Law on the Third Plan for Development, and its Executive Bylaw, which was adopted in 2001. The last one is the most invoked and the most critical one because it is a reflection of changes in Iran's policy from a very welcoming policy to a very restrictive one. This article and its bylaw provide for a council to be established to adopt policies about refugees. And these policies basically have tried to make life a little bit harder for refugees in Iran to make them voluntarily move back to Afghanistan. Among Iran's regulations concerning refugees, there are four issues that have been up for debates and subjected to criticism over the years. These regulations have roots in the three major legal instruments that I have already mentioned. Firstly, freedom of movement of refugees have been obstructed. From 2002, Iran introduced some restrictions on freedom of movement, mainly in the border areas of the country, based on the 1931 law on entrance and residence of aliens. These restrictions were largely expanded until since 2012, there are only three provinces in Iran that do not contain partial or total restrictions. Although Iran has made a reservation to Article 26 of the 1951 Convention, which requires the freedom of movement, it has an international obligation under Article 12 of International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which requires states to provide freedom of movement for those lawfully in their territories. Secondly, the right to access to free and compulsory primary education, to which Iran has international obligations according to International Covenant on Social, Economic, rights and convention on rights of the child. However, until 2015, that the Supreme Leader issued a decree authorizing every child, regardless of their legal status, to have access to education, many Afghans, especially the undocumented ones, face impediments in providing education for their children. The third restriction that Afghan refugees face in Iran is the freedom to choose occupation. National instruments have perfectly crafted a list of adult occupations to make sure that Afghan workforce 
do not steal any job opportunities from Iranian workforce. One other problem is that the work permit are only issued for the male heads of families under 60 years old and their male children. So women, especially those who are heads of families, have to engage in the informal job market. And consequently, they are at the risk of being underpaid, harassment, and without the protection of the labor law at risk of accident during work, or even not, pay, not being paid at all. Although Iran has made a reservation to Article 17 of the 1951 Convention, which requires freedom of earning the livelihood, it has an international obligation to secure freedom of work under Article 6 of International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights and Article 3 of the ILO Convention Number 111. The first issue is the problem of stateless in Iran, which stems from Iran's civil code. Iranian women couldn't pass their nationality to their children. So children born out of the marriage of Iranian women and refugee men could not receive identification until after turning 18 and renouncing nationality acquired from their fathers. However, according to a law that was adopted in 2019, Iranian women can request Iranian nationality for their children, provided that they have required documents under marriage and security institution allow for the nationality to be granted. After talking about the restrictive policies of Iran, it, should, it shall also be noted that Iran has taken some fruitful initiatives which are in essence quite rare among countries that shelter refugees. One of these initiatives is the Universal Public Health Insurance, or the UPHI, which since 2015 has granted access to health insurance for Afghan families. This program has been conducted as a result of collaboration between Iranian Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Health and Medical Education, and Iran Health Insurance Organization with the UNHCR. According to this plan, UNHCR will provide insurance fees for those with special diseases, and other families can benefit from this scheme by paying a relatively affordable fee. This scheme provides refugees with health services at an affordable cost, which can eliminate the risk of catastrophic health-related expenses, which would place the family in a fragile economic situation. Here, I wish to address some political issues concerning the residents of a considerable undocumented Afghans in Iran. In recent years, especially with the nuclear deal being at stake between Iran and Western countries, some experts argue that Iran's threats to deport undocumented Afghans influence Afghanistan's policies toward Western countries, especially the United States. Iran has argued several times that the U.S. sanctions have Iran's economy in a situation that it can no longer host refugees. The effect of economic hardship caused by the sanctions has indeed impacted marginalized populations such as refugees to a greater degree. International NGOs had difficulties receiving funds to provide protection for refugees. Moreover, compared to Pakistan, Iran has received less international support for accommodating refugees while treating them with generosity and hospitality despite difficult economic situations. At the end, I want to address the current situation of Afghanistan under the reign of Taliban from the refugee law perspective. 
several human rights violations shall be taken into consideration as some of them can amount to persecution under Article 1 of 1951 Conventions, Convention, such as the abbreviation of girls from the right, the right to education, banning women from returning to work, and forceful removing of Hazara population from their homes. I have some of the human rights violations of the Taliban regime in length in the paper. But the point I want to make here is the lack of capacity of the Iranian legal and administrative regime to deal with this new influx of refugees. Iran does not have experts to conduct individual interviews with asylum seekers. The country does not have enough accommodation capacities because a smaller number a small number of its refugees were accommodated in camps before. Therefore, Iran needs the international community's support both for establishing accommodation facilities and in terms of conducting refugee status determination. Among those who have left Afghanistan are former security members of Afghanistan who have fought against Taliban before. They are the most vulnerable group, and if returned to Afghanistan without their request being reviewed, Iran has violated the principle, the principle of non reformment Moreover, Afghanistan has had a tremendous improvement in providing primary, secondary, and tertiary education. Many of those who have left their homes are experts or even former government officials. They cannot be expected to work in the limited number of occupation allowed in Iran. They are not trained and accustomed to this type of work. Therefore, Iran's current regime shall undergo tremendous improvement to accommodate the needs of the new influx of refugees. Okay, um, right. So that was uh, a really, really comprehensive overview. I think what, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to all of the papers, and then we'll have a discussion section um, after, in which we'll be taking questions online. Um, so I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Stephanie Mellon. She's the uh, co-director for academic programs at the Center for Gender and Global Context, otherwise known as the GenSEN, here at Michigan State University. She's also Associate Professor in the Department of, of Sociology here at Michigan State. Her research and teaching expertise are in migration, refugees, and gender, with a focus on refugee resettlement and the international protection of Syrian and other refugees in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Nowen was a Fulbright Fellow at the Women's Research Center at Istanbul University during 2013-14. Um, and she has co-edited uh, the Rutledge International Handbook of Migration Studies with uh, Stephen Gold. The most recent articles are published in the Journal of Refugee Studies, the Journal of Ethnic and Racial Studies, and Journal of Immigrant and Minority Health. Currently, she is leading a project exploring how humanitarian organizations are attempting to reduce COVID-19 infections um, and provide services to refugees in Turkey. Uh, so on that note, I will turn it over to uh, Professor Nellen. Thank you very much, Dr. Harani. Um, so I am uh, going to, my presentation, I'd like everybody to keep in mind that um, this feels very much like a work in progress still to me. I'm, uh, so any feedback people have um, uh, would, I would be very much appreciated. Okay, so um, as Dr. Harani mentioned, uh, my work has focused a lot on uh, uh, refugees, mostly Syrian refugees in Turkey. I've uh, the, the big project he mentioned also expands in Jordan and Lebanon, but I'm really going to focus on the qualitative work that I've been doing uh, in Turkey. So as everyone knows, the Syrian civil war has displaced uh, millions of people, and many of them have fled to neighboring countries that are uh, like Syria predominantly Muslim. 
these countries have provided temporary protection to Syrian refugees, and uh, particularly in Turkey, uh, have claimed to do so through an Islamic ethic of hospitality. That hospitality has not resulted in widespread permanent protection or citizenship for Syrian refugees or other sets of formal rights. Some of the, there have been pathways created, but uh, the reality is very few Syrian refugees have been able to, to access those. Um, but there are possibilities for greater access to rights through informalization, uh, requiring a transformation, I think, of Islamic notions of hospitality from an ethic extended to guests who are temporary to a responsibility to care for family. And that I'm using that uh, largely as a metaphor. And again, would love uh, some feedback on that. So in this presentation, I'm gonna use the case of Turkey, drawn upon the field work I've conducted in the country with refugees uh, and advocacy and service providers and some government officials since uh, 2013 to explore the shortcomings of hospitality for protecting refugees and the possibilities for a sort of Muslim cultural citizenship that would better serve refugees in Turkey in the absence of formal rights. In making the connection between Islamic hospitality and refugee rights, I'm drawing mostly upon the body of literature that has accumulated on social citizenship. So I'm going back to T.H. Marshall, Marshall's work that defined the concept of social citizenship uh, as the right of people to access collective resources of the state. Um, other people who have kind of played with this idea, Margaret Summers, she um, developed an, uh, the concept of market fundamentalism, which is the logic that even citizens of a state do not inherently have rights to the state's resources. Uh, rather, under neoliberal capitalism, people increasingly are expected to purchase resources instead of being granted those resources through social citizenship. Summers uses the example of Black New Orleans residents um, during the, the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, being treated as non-citizens and denied access to protection and assistance by the federal government, which um, has steadily eroded emergency response infrastructure. Related to market fundamentalism is Janine Brody's concept of market citizenship, identifying the same tendency towards privatization of state resources, access to rights is increasingly limited to those who can afford to pay for them making them really not rights at all. And, and most of my early work has been grounded in this concept of market citizenship and the role of neoliberal capitalism in undoing uh, government collective infrastructure for all sorts of things, including um, uh, for assistance for refugees who are resettled in the United States and the ways in which private NGOs have kind of stepped into this space to bridge uh, albeit imperfectly, this gap in, in social citizenship. So for resettled refugees in the US, the rights to resources that should be afforded to them through their status as refugees has eroded as government ser services have shrunk, leading private organizations to fill that gap. So um, in this talk, I want to extend that logic to refugees who are hosted in Turkey and connect the idea of social citizenship to the Islamic ethic of hospitality. Hospitality has been invoked throughout the time that Turkey became a major host country to displace Syrians, really starting uh, you know, a sharp increase in about 2013 and continuing to this day. Notably, it has been invoked commonly by the government of Turkey as a rationale for providing state assured protections and assistance, but I will note this presentation uh, that has significantly eroded. I conducted my fieldwork in Turkey, primarily in Istanbul, interviewing displaced Syrians, uh, leaders of migrant rights and assistance organizations, Turkish government officials and US consulate staff. I also um, took a couple trips to Ankara to interview US embassy staff there. And um, I uh, was in Antalya for a little bit and talked to staff at a migrant organization 
a migrant assistance organization there that focused predominantly on supporting trafficked migrant women. I did most of this work in 2013 and 2014 through a Fulbright Fellowship at uh, Istanbul University's Research Center on Women, and in 2016 and 2018 in collaboration with uh, my colleagues who I want to publicly acknowledge, Drs. Nur Banu Kavakli Berdal and Tuba Demerji at Altenbosch University in Istanbul. I also want to thank uh, Vanya Pantic, Pantic, uh, Pantic Oflazalu, who provided research assistance off and on throughout this time as well. So when Syrians first began to seek safety in Turkey, the public discourse around Syrians was that they were guests and invocations of Islamic hospitality were common uh, among government agencies. The government of Turkey lauded its welcoming efforts and the refugee camps initially built uh, by the government were hailed by international observers as some of the best in the world. But all of this welcome was predicated on Syrians being guests i.e. welcomed, but only temporarily. Guests eventually go home. Turkey is not a full signatory to the Geneva Convention, having signed with a geographic limitation that restricts its adherence to Geneva for refugees originating from Europe. So Turkey does not have any international obligation to provide permanent protection to Syrian refugees. So in 2014, the government of Turkey, uh, largely in response to this large influx of, of mostly Syrian but other refugees, implemented the law on foreigners and international protection with the intent of regularizing the temporary protection of Syrians that was kind of provided ad hoc and giving them access to certain resources of the state, including legal access to the labor market. However, at this time, uh, about a third of the Turkish labor market, of tur Turkish labor force was working informally and providing formal la labor rights to Syrians uh, did not provide any sort of legal pathway, formal pathway to self-sufficiency. Turkish employers still needed to pay for work visas of their non-citizen workers, and they were limited uh, by a, a certain ratio of foreigners to Turks that they could hire. And outside of certain occupational categories, there was little incentive to hire anyone formally when the informal labor supply uh, was so plentiful. So consequently, Syrians frequently worked informally in highly exploitative situations. And most experts agree that those situations often met the definition of human trafficking. So for my research in Istanbul, I was told a lot about Syrians who hire, were hired to work often in textile factories in the city. And when um, they would work for a month and when the month was up and it was time for them to be paid, Syrians were simply fired and never compensated for their labor or they were paid one third of what uh, Turkish workers were getting. So during a field visit to Istanbul in May, 2018, I learned from key informants about uh, new checkpoints that had been instituted uh, on routes into Istanbul. Uh, what uh, people would often do is uh, they were supposed to live in some of these outlying cities, but all of the economic activity really was happening in Istanbul. And so they would, um, they would move from these smaller cities into Istanbul. And um, so the police instituted uh, checkpoints where they would stop buses and ask everyone for their identification. And if police found a Syrian refugee who didn't have authorization to live and work in Istanbul, they were arrested. The Turkish government had been in the process of moving Syrians outside of uh, major metro areas, but especially Istanbul because of the city's proximity to Europe. In March, 2016, Turkey signed the EU-Turkey Agreement which allowed EU countries to return irregular migrants uh, that had, were deemed to have passed through Turkey. And so Turkey increased the regulation of refugee movements within the country in order to dissuade uh, further migration into Europe. So when my team started doing interviews in 2016, we had these Syrian respondents who uh, you know, knew about uh, this policy and were concerned that they were going to be forced to leave their homes and relocate to less desirable cities in Turkey. 
And my Turkish colleagues told the respondents, no, we don't, we don't think that will happen. But in 2018, that is exactly what the government of Turkey was doing, especially targeting neighborhoods like Tarlabasha that uh, were low income, but avail uh, adjacent to very valuable properties and thus ripe for gentrification. So in July, 2019, News reports confirmed what our respondents have been telling us, that Syrian refugees were being arrested by Turkish police because they were living outside of where their residency cards were linked. These reports indicated that the Syrians were being taken to detention centers, uh, which had expanded during this time as well, tortured. And then after two, a couple weeks, had um, they would sign voluntary departure agreements, right, voluntary, and were taken to the Syrian border. In some cases, ISIS uh, or al-Nusra or other paramilitary soldiers were waiting for the refugees at the border. And there was one news article um, that uh, where a reporter interviewed a witness who stated that uh, a Syrian who had been, um, you know, again, voluntary, uh, 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 voluntarily removed, was met at the border by armed men, put in the trunk of a car, and driven away. So on no November 11th of that same year, in 2019, the same year, uh, President Erdogan announced that since 2016, the government had removed 356,000 Syrians from Turkey and returned them to Turkish-controlled areas of Syria. The government of Turkey defines these as voluntary returns rather than forced removals or deportations. And in debates with the main opposing party, which is JHP, uh, Republican People's Party, that's a center left party, uh, Erdogan has stated that um, unlike his opponents, his party, AKP, the Justice and Development Party, which is uh, center right, uh, they, they will not, AKP would not forcibly remove Syrians or any other refugees despite evidence that his government had done just that. So this invocation of hospitality, which was predominantly used by AKP, resonates with their more conservative Muslim voting base. However, scholars have argued that it is not an accurate measure of positive receptivity to refugees, and in fact is often used to mask refugee exclusion. Um, I think Rabia Karakaya Polat um, did some good work arguing that AKP has integrated this discourse of hospitality towards Syrian refugees into its party identity, enabling the party to quote, to declare a moral superiority, not only vis-a-vis -vis the West, but also its political competitors inside the country, primarily uh, JHP. So the shift from hospitable state to refugee repelling state demonstrates that an ethic of hospitality does not necessarily get, um, guarantee refugee protection. But there are signs that, a, that the shift from state-sponsored to private-sponsored assistance is happening and is taking on a distinctive uh, you know, Muslim flavor, uh, integrating uh, discourses of hospitality into that work. Um, I really um, appreciated Nazla Sensi's work uh, where uh, she studied the motivations of refugee assistance NGO workers in Turkey and found that religious beliefs often drive their desire to help Syrians. Similarly to what I found uh, among Christian affiliated NGO workers in the US. So this creates an opportunity for refugees in Turkey to experience, if not formal political citizenship, then at least a kind of informal social citizenship through what Darlene has called the politics of presence. This politics of presence treats a migrant's right to occupy a place as a given based on their physical existence in the place and not something tied to uh, legal citizenship or any political legal status. Darlene writes that, quote, claiming presence is delinked from assumptions of citizenship, and that is transversal in assuming rights, not through the fixity of residence, but through presence as both a statement of social fact and a transversal connection, unquote. So migrants' right to exist in a place is predicated upon their being humans and the social fact that they are currently taking up space in that place. And further, I would argue their presence is not passive, it's an active one. They are participating in economic life through providing uh, labor, 
uh, and paying rent, buying necessities, and more affluent Syrians are starting businesses and investing in Turkey's economy. They also participate in religious and cultural life by attending prayer services, creating art and music. And in Istanbul, there is an opportunity for them uh, that I don't see happening yet, but uh, an opportunity to shape the longstanding tourism industry that uh, has been in Turkey that caters to Arab visitors. No reasonable person expects Syrians to return to their country at this point. Their active presence in Turkish society should be embraced as a given, and the meaning of hospitality within this context uh, should be reconsidered. So hospitality uh, may just be maybe just a politically expedient narrative for a state, but it is almost universally a value to citizens who advocate for refugees, especially those motivated by faith. And for citizens motivated through Islamic hospitality, the presence of Syrians in Turkey means that those Syrians have a right to be safe and to be and to thrive. While there have been a number of studies in, uh, of Syrians in Turkey, less scholarly attention has been directed towards the different context of reception and of Turkish residents, uh, at least in English, which I fully admit limits my uh, understanding of this field. Um, because I'm not, my, my uh, mastery of Turkish is mostly gets me around the city and of course um, getting food, which is my favorite uh, thing to talk about in, in Turkish. Uh, the quality of surveys have varied that exist. Um, some have produced these questionable results suggesting that Turks and Arabs have always had a friendly relationship, which um, uh, is a claim my Turkish colleagues and friends have assured me is not true. Other surveys have found that Turks are predictably weary of hosting Syrians and other refugees. But there is this growing private sector in Turkey uh, that uh, still nascent, but is developing rapidly. And it includes new refugee advocacy and assistance organizations that have the potential to bridge individuals' commitment to hospitality and the needs of these Syrians, uh, providing access to material goods, advocacy in a very difficult and exploitative housing market, uh, assistance in educating their children, and other gaps that are likely to continue between what Syrian refugees need and what the state is willing to formally guarantee. Hospitality has not likely uh, ever been a, a long-term viable state policy, but it can motivate individual Turks to move into a growing space of the privatization of rights. This is an imperfect solution, I admit, to the lack of formal rights, but uh, the field of refugee protection is full of imperfect situations, and it may be the best realistic way forward for the long-term prospects of Syrian refugees in host countries. So thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's comments and Dr. Harani's um, comments as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Nowen, uh, for that really very interesting uh, discussion. And, and I think we're going to have a, a really powerful uh, set of questions and, and discussions um, afterwards, I hope. Um, right. Our, our final speaker uh, in the panel, uh, Regimes of Belonging, part one, uh, is Jinan Bastaki, <laughs> excuse me, Bastaki, who is an associate professor of international law at the United Arab Emirates University. She received her LLB from the London School of Economics and a master's from UC Berkeley uh, and a PhD from the University of London in 2017. Uh, Dr. Bastaki has conducted research in Greece, Jordan and the United Arab Emirates, publishing on the protection gaps in the legal frameworks that govern refugees and refugee lives. Her essay on nationality-based detention of refugees won the ICRC and IIHL's San Remo New Voices in International Humanitarian Law Award in 2018. And her current work focuses on the protection of refugees in uh, non-signatory states. And the title of her paper is The Right to Return Nowhere, Palestinians in the Arab States. Uh, Doctora, please. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you uh, to the Muslim Studies Program at Michigan State University for hosting this conference. Um, I'm just gonna share my, try to share my screen.
Okay, I hope that's visible to everyone. Yes? Okay, I think it is. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so, so yeah, so the title of my presentation is The Right to Return Nowhere, Displaced Palestinians um, in Arab States. And uh, so I'm going to, you know, speak a little bit, kind of introduce, you know, the, the topic of, of my paper. And I'm going to be talking about the, you know, Palestinian displacement um, in the Arab world, the, resp the response of the Arab States, and uh, how the international refugee regime uh, deals with this, uh, and then kind of conclude with showing how uh, Palestinian displacement a lot of times has been centered on these two separate issues. One, you know, the right to return to their original homes, uh, and then on the other hand, their, you know, dispossession um, in, in the states. But for me, it's kind of, it's the same issue. And the um, policies in Israel that have denied Palestinians return uh, are almost mirrored by Arab uh, by the laws in Arab states, as well as the policies and kind of the reality of secondary and multiple displacements of Palestinians. And so policies have been mirrored in Arab states that have prevented also Palestinians from having a home and hence returning. So um, anyone who's familiar with, you know, uh, the Palestinian refugee issue, the Palestinian uh, uh, issue as a whole, knows that, you know, one of the uh, quote unquote most intractable um, of issues is the issue of the right of return. Um, you know, Palestinians were uh, displaced uh, initially uh, due to the 1948 um, um, Arab-Israeli War, uh, around 750 to 900,000 uh, Palestinians uh, were displaced outside of the outside of the territory that became Israel. Um, and since then, uh, and then they hold on to the right to return to their original homes, which are now within Israel. Um, and in response, Israel has also consistently continued to deny them this right. And the right to return itself as a legal right is found in different bodies of law. Uh, it's particularly attached to uh, one's nationality. So as a national of, uh, of whatever state, you have the right to return to your state, but also as a result of the development of human rights law uh, to the state that you were you know, habitually resident in, um, uh, as well as uh, if we talk about you know, reparations, the right to return is also part of, uh, uh, can be a part of uh, comprehensive reparations. Um, and in order to, you know, preserve this right, Palestinians in general have been uh, either hesitant or even outright rejected, at least initially, um, uh, the acquisition of citizenship in Arab states. Um, and Arab states, in a sense, they complied, um, even though some Arab states were willing to negotiate with Israel to resettle uh, Palestinians um, in their states and therefore, you know, kind of close the door to any question of, you know, the right of return. Um, eventually, uh, uh, they decided that no Palestinians, to various reasons, but it's, it's not the topic of, uh, of, this, of this paper today, um, that Palestinians uh, should preserve their Palestinian identity um, and they should not be given citizenship in their host states uh, in order to preserve their right of return. And so this has resulted in this predicament of being unable to return anywhere, not just to their original homes, but in order to preserve this right to return, they do not have a right to return anywhere, even those states that they are habitually resident in. Um, and this is, in a sense, a, a slightly different way of, you know, framing the Palestinian issue, because like I mentioned initially, that there is this separation that, you know, we focus on the ill treatment uh, of Palestinians um, in um, Arab states and kind of the dispossession, and then, you know, the right of return uh, uh, to their original homes um, in Israel. Whereas, you know, the way that policies have developed, the way that, um, uh, secondary kind of issues and displacements um, um, have have turned out over the years um, has meant uh, or has has basically uh, resulted in this kind of these these policies that have uh, cornered Palestinians into the state of limbo, the state of as you know uh, Abbas Shiblek says perpetual orbit. 
um, where if they leave the place that they're habitually resident and even to go somewhere else temporarily, they don't have a right. They don't, there is a possibility that they might not be able to return to that home which they've been residing in uh, for decades. And so, you know, from the initial displacement um, in 1948, Palestinians who are resident um, in Arab state, the majority of them uh, still don't have a right to return, but it's not just they don't have the right to return to, to Israel, but it's the right, not even the right to return to um, their homes in Arab countries. And so I wanted to look at some of the uh, Israeli policies that have kind of instituted this denial of return, and then also, and then compare them with, you know, policies in Arab states that have also um, uh, instituted this denial of return, or if the policies, uh, or if they were favorable policies in Arab states, how the fact that these policies right uh, has meant that in reality, when the regime changed, when you know the political climate changed, it meant that Palestinians uh, lost these privileges. And so, as we know, you know, in 1948, Palestinians were displaced um, around the region. They were displaced to Gaza, to the West Bank, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt, Iraq, and Jordan. Uh, there's been further displacement um, since the uh, in and since the 1967 war. And Palestinians, to this to this day, they continue to be displaced um, from uh, uh, the West Bank, um, um, East Jerusalem. Um, and so initially, um, Israel passed the 1952 nationality law. And uh, in between 1948 and 1952, Palestinians who were, who were citizens of, uh, of Mandate Palestine, um, you know, they were, they were citizens under the 1925 Palestine um, Citizenship and Order uh, Law of, of the British Mandate over Palestine. Um, they were kind of in the state where legally they were still citizens of the successor state, which was Israel. And um, in an interesting case of the um, uh, Tel Aviv uh, District Court, this was in uh, 1951 or 1950, um, the judge basically said, you know, Israel is, as a successor state, um, the citizens, the, the, the previous residents, even if they're displaced now, they're considered citizens of the, success, of the successor state. Um, this, is, these, this is the law, this is international law, um, and I haven't seen any example uh, that contradicts that. So in 1952, you know, Israel passed a nationality law and nationality was for those who were resident um, at the time. And the right of return was for uh, Jews only. So any Jew um, all over the world can decide to return uh, to, uh, to Israel. In 1954, because Palestinians, some of them attempted to return, some of them wanted to check on their properties. Um, there was another law that was passed, which was the Prevention of Infiltration Law. And so this uh, allowed you know, Israeli authorities to arrest and deport uh, those who were Palestinian citizens. I mean, the law even specifically, you know, um, uh, uh, stipulates this category of, you know, Palestinian citizens or those who were habitually resident in Palestine, uh, that they are allowed to be arrested and deported for attempting to, in, you know, infiltrate according to the law, uh, or really attempting to return. Um, even after that, uh, we have the 1980 basic law on Jerusalem, which, um, you know, uh, in violation of international law, it annexed um, um, East Jerusalem uh, and referred to Jerusalem as complete and united in the capital of Israel. Um, and this basically gave the residents of Jerusalem, you know, this peculiar status where they are permanent residents um, in Israel, but they're not citizens. And so this makes their residency very, very, very easy to be revoked. Um, the last you know, a count of how many have had their citizenship, their, sorry, their residency revoked is something around, you know, 14,000. Uh, but this was, you know, I, I, want, I want to say almost a decade ago, and the latest numbers haven't been um, released. Um, and then very recently, uh, there's an entry into Israel law, there's a 2017 um, amendment, and this also allows the, revoc the, re the revocation of residency from Palestinian residents of Jerusalem for, you know, breaching a allegiance to Israel. And if one thinks that actually, you know, Jerusalem under international laws occupied territory, the, the residents, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, citizens um, or the residents of, uh, of uh, this occupied territory, they 
do not have to pledge allegiance to the state that is occupying them. And so there are many ways in which, you know, Palestinians are by law um, allow, are basically uh, the, the state uh, revokes their right uh, to be on the territory uh, that they have a right to. Uh, so, th and this, these are things in the law. Obviously, there are, for example, depredations and there are house demolitions um, um, and so on and so forth. And so all of these things, the result is that Palestinians are given a, uh, a separate status um, as basically uh, under the authority of Israel, but they are not considered um, full citizens. And all laws subsequently, they are aimed at, you know, stripping uh, Palestinians of, you know, whatever rights that they have and anything that they do have is mostly considered um, as a privilege. And so I'm only mentioning this because then we're going to see how this is somehow, you know, mirrored um, in uh, uh, some laws in, in, in the Arab states. Now, what was the response of the Arab states at the time? So firstly, we have um, the Arab League. Uh, so the Arab League um, at the time, uh, it was very active in issuing um, resolutions. Uh, the, the Council um, of, the, of, the, of the Arab League, um, the resolutions are meant to be binding if the resolution is unanimous. If it's not unanimous, it's meant to be binding upon the states that you know, voted for that particular resolution. And so, um, you know, in, um, in 1959 and 1968, uh, the Arab League issued resolutions basically calling on Arab states to preserve Palestinian, Palestinian nationality by refraining from giving them citizenship, at the same time encouraging them to treat uh, Palestinian refugees with, with compassion. Um, and uh, and so you have on this one hand this kind of this rejection of kind of of giving Palestinians you know formal rights or a formal home um, in the host states where they resided, um, but at the same time still trying to ensure that you know recognizing that the Palestinians you know are going to have been there at least you know by the time the 1965 Casablanca Protocol is passed that you know they've been there for decades and therefore there has to be some form of protection. So on the one hand you know the 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 Arab League has uh, tried to institute the separateness and criticized uh, Jordan, for example, kind of you know indirectly for giving Palestinian citizenship, um, but at the same time um, tried to pass you know some kind of. Uh, uh, you know, minimum standard of treatment for, for Palestinians. And so here we have in 1965, uh, the protocol for the treatment of Palestinians in Arab states, uh, which is, you know, known as the Casablanca protocol. So here we see that there is, in a sense, a right to, there is um, an attempt to, uh, to establish a, a right of return to the host state. So if we look at you know, Article 2, the gen it's the general right to leave and return to their host states. And so this is something that's very important. However, many Arab states, you know, they put uh, reservations um, upon many of the articles um, and uh, you know, kind of subject to the domestic laws um, and, and, and things like that. And so you know, very few countries actually accepted the Casablanca Protocol unanimously, and many had uh, some, some form of reservations on, on the different, uh, different articles, and, and you know, there are only five articles. However, after the 1990-1991 Gulf, Gulf War, sorry, uh, the, uh, uh, the Arab League then passed uh, Resolution 5093, uh, which left treatment of Palestinians to the host states. And there's, you know, in the legal literature and amongst legal scholars, there is a disagreement, you know, has the Casablanca Protocol been revoked? And uh, some are of the opinion that like it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't revoked, like you can't just revoke it um, with, you know, a resolution that just, you know, leaves the treatment there to other host states where others are of the opinion that no, it did revoke it because it's basically, it basically repealed um, the, uh, the provisions of the, Cas the Casablanca Protocol. So how did Arab states treat Palestinians? So treatment has varied, but the undercurrent has been the same, that host states are not home they are not home for Palestinians. And I you know, specifically focus on this word home because you know, uh, individuals have a right to return to their homes. Um, and, uh, and over here, um, host states are not considered homes to Palestinians. So I'm gonna briefly, because I, I don't wanna spend you know, too much time on this because I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I'm just anxious of, of going over time, um, but, uh, but in the different Arab countries, there have been, you know, you know 
very, very different laws. So Jordan, for example, is the only state that gave, you know, Palestinian refugees, you know, since, you know, 1949, uh, full citizenship um, on par with Jordanians. Now, at the time, obviously, there was a hope of incorporating, uh, you know, the West Bank, um, and it was kind of administratively, you know, incorporated, you know, the East Bank, the West Bank, and Palestinians in the West Bank as well also had a Jordanian citizenship. Um, in 1983, there started to be this differentiation. Palestinians who were residents of the West Bank were given this green card. Um, Palestinians who had family and would visit the West Bank but were residents in Jordan would be given a yellow card. Uh, in 1988, um, uh, there was a, a kind of a revocation of this administrative kind of unity. And so Palestinians who were in the West Bank were, you know, overnight, they were denationalized. Uh, and they were the Palestinians with the, with the green card. And so they didn't have a right to reside in Jordan anymore. Um, and so, uh, so, and the, the interesting thing is that the reason or the initial reason given for giving Palestinians these different color cards was because uh, Israel was encouraging Pal Palestinians to leave the West Bank and to move to Jordan. And so, uh, you know, the Jordanian authorities wanted to make sure that, wait, you know, these people with the green cards are actually resident there. So we want to make sure that they're not forced uh, or coerced into moving into Jordan proper. Um, and so, again, it's kind of to preserve this right of return to the original homes. It's like we have to block the, uh, the ability to make a home um, in the state. And then in Jordan, you also have the so-called ex-Ghazans. And ex-Ghazans are those who fled, you know, from Gaza uh, during the 1967 war uh, to Jordan. And so they've been resident in Jordan since 1967, and they are basically rightless. Um, you know, they reside in Jarash camp uh, in the city of Jarash, um, or so-called Gaza camp. Um, and uh, they're, you know, the you know, usually if you go to the camps in, in, in Jordan, they're kind of, they're, they're almost like their own cities. Whereas if you go to Jarash camp, um, it's, uh, the, the situation is, is quite dire, particularly in comparison to the other camps. Um, and so they don't have a right to, to own property. They have to pay fees. They cannot go to public schools. They cannot access healthcare. Uh, throughout the year, some changes, you know, and laws were kind of were permitted, were permitted that, okay, you can work as taxi drivers, but then again, it would be revoked. No, you cannot work as taxi drivers. They can be teachers in schools. No, they cannot be teachers in schools. And so, you know, they've had this very precarious existence um, in, uh, in Jordan. Um, and, and again, and kind of like one of the, the reasons given is that, you know, if we give them citizenship and then Israel is also going to prevent them from returning. Um, Similarly, you know, in Lebanon, for example, you know, uh, Palestinians were are given this, you know, special category of foreigners. So they are officially foreigners. Therefore, um, they are treated as uh, foreigners with regards to uh, uh, property ownership, with regards to um, with regards to uh, working in certain professions. So they're barred from working um, and, and certain professions they have to pay, you know, you know, a foreigner's fee for certain things, for certain transactions, government transactions uh, that they have in order to renew certain permits and so on and so forth. And so again, we see this, this, inst this instituting this, uh, this separate um, existence Again, in order to what to preserve this this right of return, uh, Syria and Iraq they treated Palestinians. They passed laws to treat Palestinians on par with uh, uh, with their own citizens. Um, and over here, you know, and it's it was said very. Uh, for example, in Syrian law uh, number two sixty, um, it said that you know Palestinians are to be treated as Syrians. You know, in all uh, um, aspects, um, except for property ownership, they can only own one property, but they're still allowed to to own it, um, and they they won't be given citizenship. Um, however, the fact that they have the separate status has meant that when the political situation changed, again, they fall into this precarious existence. So, you know, after the fall of the, you know, um, Saddam regime, Palestinians became targeted. They, were, they used to be very privileged. They were, you know, in government housing or in subsidized, uh, you know, uh, subsidized housing that was privately owned. Um, after that, they became targeted because it was seen that perhaps they were allied with, with Saddam, for example. Um, in Syria, the fact that they are stateless Palestinians has meant that when they, uh, when they have tried to seek um, refuge in neighboring states, that they were blocked, for example, in, in, in Jordan and in Lebanon uh, because they are Palestinian. Um, similarly, um, in, uh, in, in Egypt, Palestinians were also, uh, again, very 
privileged under Jamal Abdel Nasser because of his kind of his pan-Arab um, um, ideology. However, after the after uh, the passing of Jamal Abdel Nasser um, and uh, and uh, the assassination of the cultural uh, minister um, um, by a Palestinian um, in Egypt, all of these privileges against taken away again were taken away. And so all of these, you know, any um, preferential treatment that was given to Palestinians was always as a matter of privilege. Uh, I have no time left. Uh, you have about a minute left. Yes. So okay. I mean, I, this has been fantastic, but maybe you can sort of bring us to a conclusion. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, uh, so just two more points. And so the international refu refugee regime as well, it distinguishes Palestinians, it distinguishes Palestinian refugees, where, you know, any person who is uh, receiving help from uh, a UN agency um, is excluded from the terms of the convention. Um, and the way that, you know, different courts around the world, they've interpreted it differently, but they have basically said that, you know, if a Palestinian leaves an area where they're receiving, you know, aid from a UN agency, like which many Palestinians, you know, they receive from UNRWA, um, it, they can't have left voluntarily. Right. They cannot have left voluntarily. They have to uh, leave for reasons unconnected with the person's will. And so uh, and so, again, it, ins it, it institutionalizes the statelessness where a Palestinian cannot go and be automatically considered a refugee in another place. They have to have further proof. A very recent case against, uh, and this was under the Statelessness Convention in France, that they decided to reject the petition of a Palestinian woman uh, because it was not seen that you know she that she was forced to leave UNRWA area uh, of. Uh, of uh, of operation. Finally, what we see here, just to bring this all together, that basically the implications of all of these policies in the different Arab states, they've resulted in expulsions and secondary displacements and barring return to uh, their place of residency. And so we have many, many examples, and I'm not going to read them, you, you have them there um, in front of you. Uh, but basically what's, what has happened is that Palestinians have been denied the right to make a home uh, in the host states where they reside. And, uh, and therefore they don't have a right to return to it. And in many of these examples, when Palestinians have left Lebanon, for example, or Egypt, for example, um, they haven't been allowed to return there simply because they never had a right to be there to begin with. And so institution, instituting this separateness by denying citizenship basically marks Palestinians and it's made them an easy target during these times of turmoil. And so it's made Palestinians, you know, the state of perf perpetual orbit and uncertainty. And so in order to preserve one right of return, they've been denied the right to return anywhere else. Thank you so much. And sorry for taking more time than I should have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Bastaki, for that. Uh really wonderful discussion. Um, so what I'd like to do, if I may, um, is can, can everybody see everybody? I, this whole, uh, uh, this is my first online conference like this, and it's actually really throwing me for a loop in ways that, that I, I wasn't prepared for. Like, how do you tell people how much time they have left? Oh. Right? I, so um, mental note made. Anyway. Um, I just want to talk for a couple of minutes about uh, a couple of things that came up for me in, in the conversation. First, I want to say that um, the, the three papers were really fabulous, um, um, although they were also quite different in, in, in but overlapping. Um, uh, Ms. Hashemi's paper was really an encyclopedic overview of um, the, the Iranian refugee regime how refugees are treated in terms of, of law and regulation, uh, going back to uh, the, the early days of, of the Republic. And what's really interesting there is, is for me how uh, this, this regime has changed over time um, in terms of regulations concerning movement, education, work, health, uh, and so forth. And in, importantly, the question of citizenship. Um, and that's, that's an issue that, that uh, bedevils uh, societies all over the Middle East, throughout the Arab world and, and elsewhere. Uh, you know, the, the question of uh, citizenship rights for the, the children of women uh, from the nation, right? Can women pass on citizenship to their children if the father is not um, a national? So um, 
a really in-depth, uh, really you know, powerful overview of all of these different, different issues. Um, match that then with um, Dr. Robastaki's uh, discussion, which really brings the question of refugees into the international sphere uh, more, more prominently and places it directly within the context of the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, but also within, within the, the politics of the Arab world. And, and that's something that I would like to hear actually um, more about in, in both of these papers. And I'm gonna talk about how I might, might wanna see that, that done. So, I mean, super overviews, very detailed. I learned a tremendous amount and anybody who reads these papers is gonna learn a tremendous amount. Um, but what I would like to see going forward, uh, you know, is, is a way of, of, of contextualizing these things and putting them into a larger um, conversation outside of the domain of, of, of law. So, um, you know, connecting it to anthropological literatures, political science literatures, sociological literatures, and so forth. Um, so let me just come quickly then to, to uh, Dr. Nowen's paper. And I think this might give us some, some ways to, to think about um, the situation beyond these questions of, of law and, and regulation. Um, and I think one of the things, well, maybe just for reasons of, for, for purposes of, of, of brevity, I will just talk about a couple of things. Um, one is, is the degree to which legal uh, categories produce the objects that they are meant to regulate, right? So um, this brings me to, to mind the question of interpolations. How is it that law interpolates refugees into their, their larger uh, structures in, these, in host states, but also in, in international bodies as well? Um, and that makes me think a little bit too about the question of um, legal pluralism. And this, this brings me to, to what it, Dr. Nowen I think is, is trying to, to wrestle with is this notion of alternate um, ways of defining the refugee, um, but also defining the, the right and responsibility to care for others, right? Um, state discourses, as we've seen from the papers of, of uh, uh, Ms. Hashemi and, and uh, uh, Dr. Bestaki, can be very rigid um, and do not provide a great deal of protection. They're very, you know, even, even where rights are extended, they are always attenuated. And it's that attenuation then that always leaves that opening for, um, for things to be rolled back, depending upon political and economic uh, transformations. So we need to seek, it, it, it's not, so we need to seek some kind of mechanism by which alternative conceptions of right um, or, or relation uh, can come to the fore. And I think that's, that's what uh, Dr. Nowen is, is looking for. Um, how is it that perhaps uh, religious discourses might provide some kind of a basis for um, a more holistic approach to the world? How is it that alternate non-state non sanctioned um, conceptions of citizenship, social citizenship, for example, um, can, can start to underpin these things? Of course, they're very, very, very fragile in a world in which the state uh, remains, the nation state remains the default uh, category for, for international law, but also for social science, right? So what I would suggest, what I am suggesting, and we can talk about this further as, as the, the conversation proceeds, um, you know, how can we look to uh, an ontology of, of relations rather than one um, between you know, nation states um, in which the, the nation state is taken as the norm. So um, on that note, I want to, I don't want to talk too long. So I've already gone uh, my six minutes. So I would like to open the floor to uh, questions for our panelists. Now, I'm not sure who monitors the questions. Is that Muhammad? Yeah, I'll just jump in and say that uh, if you would like to type in a question for those who are attendees, um, you look for the Q&A box. Uh, if you're on a laptop, if you move the cursor, you'll see at the bottom. If you're on a cell phone, a smartphone, you may have to look around a little bit. 
look for the three dots and uh, and you should be able to find it there. And of course, if there are questions from the uh, the panelists, from the other conference presenters, uh, please raise your hands. Thank you. Okay, well, perhaps maybe I'll, I'll push on just a little bit more. Sure, and I do see a question also from- uh, Oh, is there? Yeah. Oh, it's not showing up on my- Oh, okay. If you look up, if you look under the participants, you'll see uh, some a couple of hand uh, symbols there next to uh, Guzdi and Jyotjitsna. Yeah. Ah, okay. Then I will defer, please. Sure. In this case, why don't we start with Guzda? Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to be among you. And these were all like awesome, awesome papers and discussions. I really appreciate uh, listening to you and being here. Uh, it's 7 a.m. here, so I may not be very bright, but I'll just keep it very short. Uh, my question uh, is concerning uh, Dr. Stephanie Nevin's paper. I was wondering uh, whether uh, you could talk a little bit about how actually maybe this hospitality discourse perpetuated by the AKP in Turkey I know I yes it has this like very Muslim flavor and it is trying to situate itself itself within an Islamic ethics of hospitality but when we talk about Turkey uh, I cannot escape from the idea that there is always also a nationalist flavor of hospitality and this reminds me of this like there is does discussion about like conditional hospitality etc which is probably relevant, but also, I mean, it doesn't have to be that, but this thing about Turkish yearly and milli, this like local and national, I think probably have penetrated to this discourse of like religious hospitality as well. And I was wondering whether uh, you had some comments about this. Yes, I really appreciate your comment. Uh, your question and and the framing of this as a political strategy because mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is right so um and it, and it's it has as as a you know someone who was born and raised in the united states and is so used to the particular you know politics of our two major poli uh parties um it really upended my understanding of liberal and conservative views of immigration right so um you know i i as a, as an academic and i'm friends with a lot of other academics in in turkey and uh, most most of whom identify as you know uh left uh jhp or hdp you know supporters and so definitely not fans of erdogan and i want to uh, you know just to frame this too i'm not also a fan of erdogan i mean but, who is the FN of Erdogan at this yeah. point? But well, yeah. you know, but he's managed to stay in office for uh, dictator-like lengths. So you know, the what was interesting was when I when I got to when I I had been to Turkey before, but when I got there in 2013, the conversation around uh, immigrant rights and and refugee protection was so strange because I, you know, there were all of this, you know, among conservatives, there was this, you know, we welcome these refugees. And it was just, you know, so they were not at all like the conservative, uh, conservatives in the United States, right, who are much more. And then my liberal friends were so into these conspiracies that, you know, oh, um, Erdogan is just letting these Syrians come in and giving them uh, citizenship right away so that they can they they'll vote for him and um you know and i didn't see any evidence of this happening but this was something said to me by so many of my of my liberal turkish friends and so um absolutely the way in which uh the justice and development party you know akp akp had embraced this um, you know, protection of, of, of Syrians specifically, right? Uh, there was, sometimes it was refugees, but it was always clear they were talking about Syrians, they were not talking about Afghans, they were mm -hmm. not talking about Iraqis, and they were not talking about, 
um, probably many legitimate asylum seekers coming from, from African, sub-Saharan African countries who definitely not talking about them. So, um, and it, it absolutely was tied up in nationalism and Syrians, I think, recognize that. So mm -hmm. when um, the coup attempt happened in July, 2016, um, I uh, knew uh, some Syrian families who told me, we packed our bags that night because we thought if Erdogan is overthrown, we'll have to leave. We will be thrown out of the country. And, um, you know, and, and also too, to say in the United States, uh, our, all governments do this, right? I'm not, I'm not calling out the Turkish government specifically that the United States uses, uh, the governments use this discourse of we're an immigrant nation as a political tool. And when it's no longer politically expedient, it's abandoned. I, I do think that, you know, it's sort of this concept of moral man and immoral society. Mm -hmm. that um, you know, uh, as collectives, and especially as a collective that the government is, which is really you know, a tool of control, let's, you know, right? That the nation state, its um, responsibility is to, is, to, is to police borders and um, you know, police individuals within that border and more often than not, uh, uh, defend those in power right you know um even even when done in a democratic fashion it's still right this is always this tension that that any use of hospitality or anything that sounds charitable or moral is is a political strategy always because it will be even if it's even if it's embraced by the individual speaking mm -hmm. those words right making those claims invariably it will be dropped when it's no longer you know politically expedient and akp has absolutely like they, they very much a kind of Islam, Muslim Islamic nationalist party and mm -hmm. in the way that, um, you know, so, uh, so that's to say that I'm definitely don't want to be read as AKP is the heroes here, just okay. that, right, that um, it's a, it, I think, and, and this is my kind of um, abandonment of faith in government. <laughs> that I think that I would love to see government come and do the things that we all, you know, as supporters of a democratic uh, regime would would support. But ultimately, I think individuals have to come into this space because government uh, really, even in the best of circumstances, is rarely serving uh, the people who need it most. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Nowen, um, and Goji for your question. Uh, Jatsna and then Salah Hassan, where did Salah go? I don't know if he's with us. Anyway, uh, Jessna, and then yeah. I would like to uh, remind people that you can type your questions into the Q and A uh, on the on on the screen, and we can get to you that way as well. Uh, so, uh, Jessna. Yeah, this is. Uh, they were both excellent papers, and I really learned a lot. And I am interested in hospitality. My question was for Jinan. It's somebody who doesn't know enough, and I learned a lot. Is there a kind of lot of work done on the idea of a Palestinian diaspora? Because I thought what was fascinating is I didn't know is how many of them live, say, in Syria and Iraq, where I've visited, and for years, and they don't have citizenship. And, and I'm sure like in the Gulf states and, you know, among scholars, among activists, what is, what is the dialogue or the conversation around the sort of scattered Palestinians? You know, they are the scattered people now. So I would love to just hear from Janan on this. Thank you so much for, for that question. So there's a lot um, on, uh, on you know, Palestinian displacements and Palestinians who are resident um, in Arab states, whether it's academic literature, um, activist literature. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot on that. And so the, you know, um, the Palestinians who are in the Arab world, I mean, the numbers that we have are those who are registered with, with UNRWA. Those are, those are the numbers in a sense that like are registered with the UN Refugee and Works Agency for uh, Palestinian refugees in the Near East. East. And so this was, you know, set up um, after the Arab-Israeli war in order to provide, you know, um, aid and assistance for uh, for the, the Palestine refugees. There's a specific definition, and they're around five point something million. Now, this also doesn't account for uh, the Palestinians that fled to states uh, that are not within underway areas of operation. So when I talk about Iraq and when I talk about Egypt, for example, we actually don't have, you know, uh, specific numbers. Like in Iraq, it's between 
34 to 94,000. It's literally like it's that vast because the Palestinians who fled there between 48 and 58, they were given a specific status. Um, and, uh, and they were, you know, recognized as having, you know, similar rights or the same rights as, uh, as, as Iraqis. However, again, because of, you know, Arab League resolution that, you know, don't let Palestinians leave after the 1967 war, those who did flee to Iraq, they were, uh, they never registered, they couldn't register with anybody. And so they were kind of, again, they're, they're under the surface. Um, they couldn't really get um, any aid or any help. But then in 2001, Saddam said that all Palestinians would be treated as Iraqis. Uh, but again, we don't really have numbers. There's no like registration. Similarly for Egypt, um, most of those who went there were from Gaza, uh, but there were some of them were returned to Gaza, um, and uh, and you know they um, and again they were given certain you know privileges, particularly under Jamal Abdel Nasser. But then you know uh, uh, after that, those privileges were kind of were revoked. Many of them have you know temporary uh, permits, uh, temporary travel documents, uh, but they're not easily renewable. So you know again they don't have a right to return to Egypt, and even and that's you know at the discretion of the authorities. Um, and so there's always this fear of like, well, if, well, is Egypt going to accept us? And if they do accept us, how are we going to live? Because we don't have any rights. Um, in terms of the Gulf countries, that's something that I, that I, that I didn't uh, mention, just because those who went to the Gulf countries initially, uh, meaning in, you know, after 1948, some, uh, there were fewer in number, um, uh, and some of those who kind of, who went there as, you know, uh, let's say immediately after, some were given citizenship, um, very few, but you know, some in Kuwait, some um, um, in the UAE, uh, but most of them kind of went there from Jordan with you know, a Jordanian citizenship or with other kinds of um, um, travel documents. Um, and so they either went there again, like as uh, with uh, different citizenships, but knowing that they are Palestinian, and some, again, very, very few numbers were, were, uh, were given citizenship in, in different um, Gulf countries. So the situation really varies uh, depending on uh, which, which country they're in, the, the state policies uh, uh, towards them. Uh, but kind of the thing that definitely brings them together is this kind of this, uh, this dispossession, this inability to return. Um, even, for example, in Jordan, I don't have time to, to, I mean, in the paper, I talk about it in more detail. But, you know, even in Jordan, you know, sometimes citizenship did not protect them from being, you know, uh, from being expelled. Uh, some were expelled to Syria at some point, some were expelled to Lebanon. Similarly, you know, Lebanon, when the PLO left in the 1980s, they took like 12,000 people off the register, even though some had nothing to do with the PLO. Um, and so they couldn't return either. So there are a lot of issues. And so there are definitely, there's a lot of, you know, uh, data and literature out there on, you know, Palestinians who are resident in the different Arab states and the treatment and the laws that, you, uh, that apply to them. Sorry. Doctor, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, we have very limited time, um, so I'd like to quickly, uh, Salah Hassan, then May Sai Ali has a question that I will, I will read out, and then Linda Sayed. Um, but I would ask uh, people to keep their questions brief and, and for panelists to, to also uh, keep their responses brief. Yeah, my question uh, kind of follows up on that. And is there a paradigm, an Arab or a Muslim paradigm for thinking about diaspora and return outside of, um, because those concepts are very much tied to Zionism. And, and so Zionism emerges in the Jewish diaspora around the idea of the law of return in large part, which gets formalized in the Jewish state. So is there a way for us to think of our own um, paradigm and language and uh, this is a broader discussion that isn't necessarily tethered to um, Jewish nationalism. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, I think because in terms of, you know, the, the Palestinian issue, because it was so linked to the United Nations, so, you know, the British Mandate over Palestine and then the partition plan, you know, Resolution 181. And so actually, uh, you know, the Palestinian issue has been subsumed under this international law language. Um, you know, a lot of Palestinians, I mean, even if you go to the camps, you'll see little children who will say, according to Resolution 194, we have a right to return. Like literally little children, you will see sometimes the, the graffiti on the wall. So the language is really very much kind of uh, this international law language because this gives, you know, uh, Palestinians uh, or, you know, the, the cause uh, in a sense, you know, legitimacy um, in the international um, arena. I mean, you know, 
know, prior to that, uh, you know, Palestinians talked about, you know, or at least, you know, the PLO, for example, that the land of Palestine is for everybody who lived in Palestine uh, prior to prior to 1948. And this was a land for people well, of all religions and every, you know, they were all, you know, Palestinian of different faiths. Um, and so there wasn't even they, they the, you know, in those days or, you know, this was, you know, up until maybe 1967 or, or a little bit after there wasn't even talk of of uh, of like the uh, of return it was more of liberation uh, that was kind of like the the language that was used so return kind of came after when it almost it, there was almost there was no hope that Palestine would be liberated, but rather, okay, fine, we have to now accept this language of return because also international law supports language of return. And that's our only tool to be able to, you know, gain this international legitimacy. I'll stop because I'm, I'm uh, cognizant of the time, uh, but definitely something for, for a further conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I think uh, May Saitali has, uh, written a note here, it says, from a social historian's perspective, how has uh, Palestinian, how have Palestinians dealt with the hurdles of existence um, and residence, and how are they finding solutions to their families' problems and the future? As we note, they have suffered continuously since 1948, um, and we can particularly see the situation uh, of Palestinians in Gaza and in Lebanon. So the question is, you know, well, we, we've been seeing discussing this very much from the top down, um, you know, how can we talk about uh, Palestinian circumstances or those of, of Afghans as well um, from the bottom up? Um, so I did, uh, I, I actually had, um, I did research um, in Jordan and I uh, visited uh, the camps, this was in, in 2020, 12 to 20 to 2014 um, and actually talking to you know Palestinians and you know who lived in who lived in the camps um, and in terms of this like bottom up so there is like a split you know there are many you know Palestinians who have been able to and who have the means they have uh, you know moved abroad um, and uh, if they are able to, obviously, this is only like a subset of people uh, and, you know, uh, you know, acquired citizenship, you know, somewhere else. And the very interesting thing about that is that this citizenship is actually used to resist. Uh, this was like a topic of a, of a paper that I had written that basically, you know, before the language of the right of return is, you know, you know, if you get citizenship, you, you give up the right of return, you forfeited the right of return. Whereas now many, you know, the Palestinians who are able to, you know, move abroad and get, you know, citizenship in another country, they're saying this citizenship allows us to resist uh, and to advocate for the right of return uh, because we're not focused on simply surviving. Um, and so this is kind of, you know, a subset of Palestinians. However, for those who are you know, in the camp, some of them actually said they're like, you know, we're here. Why? Because of the right of return. Uh, even if I were offered citizenship, I wouldn't I wouldn't take citizenship. And so some it's just kind of a like a survival. Um, wherever, you know, in the place that they are, because there are no, there are no options. Um, and more recently in Lebanon, there has been kind of, you know, uh, again, amongst some Palestinians, um, uh, you know, demanding kind of like human rights, and now it's moved to a human rights discourse that, you know, we don't want citizenship, but at least we want to be able to live with dignity. Uh, we want our human rights. So that's, you know, all I can say again for now, because I don't want to, I don't want to take uh, more time because I think the time is up. But, uh, you know, that those are kind of uh, just like an, uh, a brief kind of overview over uh, what's happening um, on bottom up, but it's a very, very large topic. I mean, there's, you know, different countries where Palestinians are, so it, it definitely requires more than a, you know, two line answer. Right. Okay. Very good. Yeah. The, 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 the issues we're dealing with are, are enormous. Um, and, and so, but I, I do want to thank you for the, the thoughtful commentary. Um, uh, we have next uh, Linda Sayed. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, very quickly. I'll be very quick. And this is for Dr. Nan, I think. Um, I know you're dealing with a lot of uh, questions about um, humanitarianism. So I'm wondering if you're using the literature, you research and kind of the politics of piety that's like articulated by largely anthropologists like Sabah Mahmoud, Lara Deeb, who work on Talal Assad's work, the ways in which kind of these, polity, these pieties or pious acts um, are possibly kind of not only changing the meaning of, of hospitality, but also changing meanings in terms of um, 
what it means to be a Muslim, Muslim practices, Islamic practices. So I'm wondering if that is something that comes up in, in terms of this exchange, that it's not a one directional exchange in which um, Turkish um, uh, citizens are assisting um, uh, refugees um, in, in terms of producing some sort of form of hospitality, but also how is it kind of reciprocal in terms of changing notions of what polity or pious acts mean for Turkish residents and citizens as well. So I'm wondering if that's something that you articulate in your research. Well, so this is why I, I wanted to present this to this audience. No, I'm not aware of this literature. I've been, so I'm really coming from, uh, from this project as somebody who's a migration, gender migration scholar who is working in uh, a predominantly Muslim context. And so uh, where I'm weakest at is in where, where this audience is probably the strongest. So I, um, I've been mostly thinking about this in, in terms of of um, uh, you know, forced migration studies, precarity, and and citizenship rights, citizen broadly defined beyond legal, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna look into this. And if you are open to sending me particular author citations, I would be very appreciative. Thank you very much, Linda. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Linda, I was thinking very many, much the same thing. Um, Thinking about uh, you know Islamist movements and and you know Asif Bayat's question, do they really have um, uh, a political or a social agenda? Um, and then Lara Deeb's work about um, how such politics are often about those that practice them more so than than the object. And so, um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, I think we're just about at the end. I did want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Marin, uh, uh, Dr. Hashim. Um, about uh, her work and, and to ask really quickly, if we could, um, how the different positions that vis-a-vis uh, -vis refugees in Iran might be betraying similar kinds of, of political commitments amongst Iranians. And are there uh, organizations that are operating beyond the state or um, alongside the state or through the state? Um, and how does do those relations perhaps um, color the, the circumstances? I know that's probably a huge question now that I hear it, um, but if you could, thank you. Well, it seems we do not have uh, we do not have a link functioning there. Muhammad, she's there. She's she's muted. Oh yeah, I see the video is on. She's there. She's just muted. Oh, we can't hear you. I can't hear you. Okay. There you are. Hello. No, I didn't get the question. Would you please repeat it for me? Ah, okay. Um, just really quickly, and it's a huge question, we're just about out of time, um, but I wanted to ask about, uh, you know, social, uh, civil society organizations or organizations beyond the state and how they might be um, addressing some of these issues. Uh, again, I'm sorry, it's sort of the last, last question, so uh, really quickly, if you could point us in the right direction. Of course, uh, since you mentioned that the first, uh, first of your uh, notes on the papers, I, I wanted to add that um, maybe contrary to what uh, Professor no Novan has um, experienced in Turkey, in Iran, uh, the hospitality has been reversed. I mean, in, in the 80s, the government showed a lot of hospitality toward the refugees, but as the society grows, and there are now international NGOs um, working in Iran with regards to refugees and in Iranian NGOs working with regards to refugees and providing them with services. Now the society um, is more um, demanding of the government to respect refugee rights. And now the society is showing hospitality. But in the 1980s, it wasn't like this. The society looked at the refugees as, as some who actually deprives them of the job opportunities or um, many governmental 
facilities. But now the society has actually changed it um, because now we have many NGOs working with the refugees. A lot of them are Iranian, um, but we also have the Norwegian Refugee Council, which is you know, it is an international um, NGO, and we also have the Relief International working in Iran for uh, providing refugees with education and health programs. I think, I don't know if I have answered your question, but I, I think because you told me that you have very little time, I think. Yeah, definitely, it is, it, is a, um, it, is a, it is a big question. And so um, we, can, we can continue this conversation over the next, next day or two, but I'm, I think a lot of people are very interested in, in knowing more about sort of the lay of the land within Iran um, and how maybe local uh, efforts link up to um, regional or transnational. If you just we, let me, oh, okay. uh, I just wanted to uh, say that there has been a recent paper in just uh, two weeks ago, uh, which actually uh, addressed the situation in Iran, uh, the, so the social si situation in Iran. Uh, from uh, Professor Jadali and Professor Mogadam, uh, I think it would help a lot of people realize how the Iranian society has changed over the years to now welcome refugees more than they had in the 80s. Okay. Well, actually, if you have a citation for that, perhaps we can circulate to that to the, to the group um, and have that as, as part of our conversation uh, for, for tomorrow. That'd be awesome. Listen, I want to thank all of the panelists uh, very much and I want for really fantastic uh, papers. And I'd like to thank everyone for their questions and for the, the great discussion. We have about 10 minutes until the next uh, session begins at 11 o'clock. And so um, everybody, please feel free to go and grab yourself a cup of coffee, um, a quick bite to eat, and we will reconvene at 11.